Hello, 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 everyone. And how are you going today? Okay. I hope that you're all having an amazing day because I'm having a somewhat amazing day, except that for the fact that, you know, I have had to sacrifice my usual morning exercise to record this video, prepare this short video lecture for you. So I hope that you're grateful for it. Yes, 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 please pay attention, okay? So today's video is going to be on the topic of Orientalism, which is a rather common theme in Western academic literature when talking about the Orient or the East. Now, um, I'm gonna keep this short, try and keep it to 10 to 15 minutes, but if I exceed 15 minutes, um, yeah, sorry for being long-winded, chong eh? Okay, uh, what is Orientalism? That's gonna be our first, uh, uh, our first focal point. Gonna define what it is in very, very broad terms, very loose terms, but uh, it is best to actually read Edward Said's book. Oh, I'll mention who Edward Said is later, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna talk about Orientalism uh, I'm going to be using six quotes from prominent, very well-respected Westerners um, that have an Orientalist sort of, uh, uh, well, an Orientalist kind of uh, narrative. So basically, yeah, you will understand what Orientalism is. It'll be very, very clear to you by the end of this lecture, okay? And uh, lastly, I'll just briefly discuss on whether Orientalism can be reconciled with the rising East. Uh, is it possible, of course, for Orientalism and a rising Asia to coexist? Okay, let's get into it. All right, um, let's move to the next slide. Okay, uh, Orientalism is a term that was actually, uh, it, was, it, was, it was coined by the Palestinian professor, uh, Professor Edward Said. Um, now, basically, he wrote a book entitled Orientalism, actually. You should really read it. I'll try and find an online link and put in the description. Um, you know, I only have the hard copy, but I don't know if I can find the uh, online link, but I'll try my best, okay? Um, yeah, the East, China, Indian, and et cetera, at least in the modern uh, Western context is known as the Orient. Um, the word Asia is actually a Greek goddess, the name of a Greek goddess. And um, the, understanding of Asia from Alexander's point of view, Alexander the Great's point of view, would have been very, very different from the understanding of Asia from a modern Westerner's point of view. Um, and Asians were known historically as Orientals uh, during the days of colonialism. Now, let me just move this uh, box up a little bit. Yeah, my move my ugly face up a bit. Okay, right. Um, when Western academics or Western people study Eastern civilization, they sometimes view it through an Orientalist lens. So um, they view it through the myopia of their own culture, right? Um, as I mentioned in point number four. So they often judge it, you know, through the myopia of their own Western value system. And sometimes they form erroneous judgments about the people they fail to understand the unspoken cues and unspoken rules that only someone who grew up in that culture would be able to pick up on. And they may paint a misrepresentative picture of the Orient. Like, do you know Anna Leonowin's the, in the Anna and the King, that, um, that famous uh, movie that was actually banned in Thailand for spreading misinformation? <laughs> okay. Anna Leonowin's traveled to Siam many, many years ago. Um, in the Victorian era. And back then, only uh, people of luxury, people of privilege could travel to other countries. So a lot of people in the West got their information of the Orient, of the East, from travelers. But oftentimes, many of these travelers' um, accounts of the Orient were painted in not always a very, very um, savory manner. Now, sometimes they would look at cultural differences of the Orient, and they would uh, judge the culture of the Orient as being inferior, or they would see the differences in culture as being a sign that the Orient has not yet progressed to the level of enlightenment and spirituality of the West. Okay, now, oftentimes, you know, because Westerners fail to understand certain cues or certain 
rituals or unspoken rules of the Orientals. Uh, they sometimes, colonial uh, accounts of Orientalism, or Orientals have sometimes um, portrayed Orientals as being lazy, indulgent, and sometimes even dangerous, okay? So, as I mentioned, yeah, a lot of academic literature is biased due to cultural myopia. So, the West is portrayed as normal and acceptable, and the Orient as bizarre and exotic, albeit regressive other, okay? All right, um, if you see over here, I've got two pictures of very, very different movies. Now, uh, many people would agree that, uh, that the left movie represents Asians in a positive way, while the right movie, Fu Manchu, uh, represents Asian men, like myself, in a very, very, very negative way. So because we're portrayed as these, um, you know, these uh, macho, patriarchal, sexual deviants. Well, but the thing is, what you fail to, what I argue is that many Asians did not like crazy rich Asians uh, because I think it made us look like very, very one-dimensional, lacking in personality, vapid, status-obsessed, and, you know, and money-minded. So these are also Orientalist stereotypes, you know, and, and I feel that Crazy Rich Asians was a chock full of Orientalist stereotypes. But, um, I'm trying to keep the video short, so let's keep going. All right, um, I'm going to give you the first example of Orientalism. Now, this is a very uh, well-respected uh, YouTuber among the Tradcon right-wingers of the West, so you have to understand he sees things from a 1950s Tradcon perspective, okay? Masculine Western culture versus uh, feminine Eastern culture. Okay, this gentleman's name is Alexander Grace. I mentioned him in the previous video. I have a Thai friend who now lives in Australia, and she explained to me why her friends would prefer to date Western men. She says that Thai men are too passive. They lack ambition, and I've highlighted the key words. Um, they often live with their parents well into their 20s and 30s, and that's normal in their culture. And I should say also in most other Asian cultures. So when they compare them with Western men who are ambitious, masculine, and financially independent, the Thai men just have difficulty competing. Now, the reason why I take issue with this uh, quote is first of all, he's using an Asian person to give credence to his views, right? Instead of just saying it, he's taking an Asian person to give credence to his point of view. However, the fact that this person is living in the West, the fact that this person does not, is not in agreement with her Thai culture, does not, it, it sort of negates his point of view that Western culture is masculine and Asian culture is feminine. Now, I'm sort of rushing through it, so I, I, I hope I sound articulate. Okay, first of all, um, in, for example, lack ambition. That's a very, very bold thing to say about Asian men. <laughs> and uh, living with our parents well into our 20s and 30s. Now, in the Western countries, of course, we know that this is not commonly accepted. Okay? If you live with your parents in your 20s and 30s, you're seen as a loser, a deadbeat, you know, somebody who, who is you know, sitting in the basement playing video games while his parents are working hard trying to support him. But, this is not so in Asia. So the implied meaning, the implied meaning of grace is that, you know, um, Asian men, because by extension, Asian men, because since this is the same in all other Asian countries, Asian men are lazy, they're unproductive, they're not ambitious, driven, and hardworking. That seems to be the implied meaning. But what if I told you that this is the custom in Asia in fact, in our Confucian culture as well, especially family cohesion is very, very uh, important. And a lot of Westerners who come to Asia do not understand why cohesiveness is so important in an Asian culture. For instance, they don't understand why, you know, the, the, they have so many family gatherings and, and you know, the, they can't understand why, for example, their girlfriend, and this is from personal experience, they can't understand why their girlfriend cares so much what their friends and family and uh, relatives think of the boyfriend or they 
they can't understand why um, in, you know, in Asia, people live with their parents well up to marriage and they don't cohabit. Well, this is just a cultural difference between Asia and the West. So you come to Asia, you recognize the cultural differences, but you do not judge and criticize our culture our cultural differences as being shortcomings compared to the West, right? So you get an Asian girlfriend and you, you, you have to understand that there are gonna be certain things that she does differently from what you are accustomed to. You cannot simply expect her to assimilate into your Australian culture because that's, that's not how the way it works, you see. So like, it's just like, you know, when the, a lot of, sorry to say, but a lot of Western men, when they actually get Asian girlfriends, they, they don't seem to, they seem to just assume that the Asian woman wants to adopt Western values and wants to basically throw off her, or her Asian heritage. But oftentimes they find that that's not really true. You know, they, you, you have to understand that the culture is just different, okay? Living with our parents, does not make us lazy, indulgent, and unproductive um, bums. In fact, we are actually very, it is a sign of filial piety in Asia, not a sign of laziness and indulgence, to live with your parents, give them allowance, and take care of the household and the family for your retired parents. So, and if you've done a lick of research, Alex, if you've even done a lick of research on our Asian culture, you would know that living with our parents is not seen as a shortcoming of Asian culture by most Asian women in Asia itself. In fact, over 90% of them actually do live with their parents and they will not move out and cohabit with you just because you bring superior Western culture over, okay? So, yeah. Okay, another quote of Grace's, which is, um, is basically a subjective quote of his and, okay. Um, it was making a subjective comparison between Eastern masculine ideal, the Eastern masculine ideal and the Judeo-Christian post-industrial revolution masculine Western ideal, the AKA the Don Draper or the uh, James Bond or the Rambo or the Conan the Barbarian and applying traditional Western masculinity as the universal standard of masculinity because men are diverse. We're not all this, we're not, not all cultures have this cookie cutter expectation of a treadcon 1950s button up man who goes to work, comes home to a hot dinner and reads the newspapers. You are only talking about a small subset of men throughout the world. And yet you are using that as the universal standard of masculinity. Well, you know, the thing is, the problem with this is that Eastern masculinity, besides the fact that you guys had an industrial revolution in the West, Eastern masculinity and Western masculinity are two shoots that, um, that grew from very different roots. Now, I could be wrong, but modern Western masculinity, you know, the, it, it largely is derived from Greek and Roman, Greco-Romano ideals, right? Like short hair, muscles, um, fitness, and all that. Uh, v taper and all that and and you know uh, yeah that that seems to be the uh, universally accepted well form of masculinity in the media now now um, that that is fine you see the Ro the Romans the Spartan warriors Caesar Alexander the Great that's the type of masculinity that Western masculinity originated from and then some Westerners when they look at um, you know the the guys who are considered hot in Asian culture like those uh, K-pop opas. Oh, they look at guys in like those, there was a Shanghainese actor whose name just escapes me. They look at them, some guys from the West will just look at them and think, oh my God, how can any <laughs> woman find those girly men attractive? Why don't they want a real macho man, you know, like Conan the Barbarian or Rambo? Because the, the masculinity ideal of the East is derived from largely from Confucianism. Confucianism doesn't place such an emphasis on machismo, muscles, and, uh, and alpha, alpha um, Yeah, that's a term that, that they often use in West, alpha male, beta male. There's, we don't have such concepts in the East because uh, we, we recognize that masculinity is a fluid concept, you know? Uh, 
Uh, we judge masculinity by very, very different standards. Like, are you a good son? Are you a good, pro uh, are you a good uh, uh, provider to your wife? And, you know, but we don't look at, for example, outward uh, trappings. Like, we, we, don't, we don't look so much at the man's exterior. Um, we don't look at muscles or things like that. Like, uh, okay. I'm 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 babbling on really fast, and I'm gonna sound a bit. I I when I watch this video, I might think I sound a bit ridiculous, but yeah, that's the you cannot judge like you cannot say that Western masculinity, for example, is the uh, is by default the the uh, how shall we say the default type of universally universal masculinity that should be aspired to because. If it was, <laughs> K-pop singers wouldn't have so many screaming, crazy fans, right? They obviously don't meet the stereotypical Western norms of masculinity, at least the Tradcon, Ben Shapiro type of expectations of masculinity. And yet, these guys have no problem getting late, and neither do I. Okay, um, yeah, I, I do wear um, cosmetics. Yeah, it's not unacceptable. The only time it actually became controversial to me was when I actually went to Australia to study. Otherwise, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't lift weights or, or do any of those things until I went to Australia. Okay, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, Orientalism example three. I'll link this article in the, uh, the uh, what you call it? The chat box, the, the box down there. Okay, um, this American journalist named Patrick Brown said, Lee Kuan Yew's assertion that there is no other way to govern a Chinese society is simply another way of saying that Chinese people do not deserve the same human rights as others. Okay, the last three words are a bit interesting to me. He says that they are unworthy of democracy. Um, a lot of Westerners, including Western liberals, will get very, very angry when you say you don't necessarily agree with democracy. Lee Kuan Yew was treated, the Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, because he was not fully uh, in agreement with Western democracy. He thought, the quote, a quote by his is that, you know, with a few exceptions, democracy has not brought good government. Like look at Rwanda, I mean, look, at, look at places like Philippines. They have democracy, but do they have a civilized standard of living? Uh, I'm not gonna be uh, discussing the, diff I'm, go I'm not gonna sp be spending this video talking about the bad things about democracy, because um, quite palpably, there are many good things about democracy, you know, such as uh, representation of the common man, giving representation to the common man's views and all of that. But it's not the, you know, by when you use democracy as the gold standard of a proper civilization, and the, the, the manner in which you measure whether a civilization is civilized or not, you are also viewing it through a very Orientalist West, uh, Orientalist lens, because may I remind you that the concept of democracy as we know it originated in the pantheon of Greece and the halls of Rome. You know, they, they did not come from China. For thousands of years, China had no democracy even before the CCP and we were fine. We had a benevolent meritocracy under the Han Dynasty, but unfortunately, you know, it, it's, um, it's, we have this uh, fixation on the word democracy as if it's the uh, magic pill for solving all the world's problems. And uh, it's very, very Western, it's a very Western chauvinistic sort of thinking. Um, and and it, he, to, for people to act like Singaporeans were these oppressed and, 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 uh, brutalized people by this evil Chinese dictator Lee Kuan Yew is extremely patronizing because if you go to Singapore, you ask most Singaporeans what they think about Lee Kuan Yew, you're not going to get this narrative. He was a dictator, but he was a dictator who did good by his people. And the Western journalists just will not accept it because he did not toe the line of the civilized West in every sense because of his Asian values. Okay, Orientalism example four, uh, non-Western civilizations, ergo non-Western people lack ethics, order and intellect, and they have contributed little 
compared to the enlightened West. And it was thanks to the enlightened West that these people are thriving now, you know, due to the noble white man's burden, we have all these good things and fuck whatever the Asians and Africans have done. Okay, Sam Harris is a very, I think this, this is actually a quote by Sam Harris, but um, yeah, I, I forgot to put his name here, Sam Harris. Most of human progress arose in the West. Science is a Western breakthrough. Liberal democracy, as I mentioned, is this even objectively good? It's just a, it's a, it's a science, it's just a style of doing things, but the rule of law, equality before the law, freedom of thought and expression, a universal expression of human rights, separation of church and state. These are our most entirely Western inventions, and they are the foundation for almost everything that is good in our world. Ah, oh, yeah, his name is here. Okay. <laughs> okay, the, the, the problem is, all right, Sam, you, you think that science was a Western breakthrough, right? Okay. How about, and, and you know, fuck, whatever the Asians and the Africans contributed. Okay, how about you stop using paper, toothbrushes to brush your teeth, algebra, printers to print your books with, compasses to navigate yourself with, cataract surgery for your eyes, distillation for your Western whiskey, shirt buttons for those perfectly tailored suits that you Western chauvinists love, love to wear, astronomy, pediatrics, convex lens, shampoo. How about you stop shampooing your hair? Huh? How about we stop using black ink to, to print your books as well? And of course, want to get a tooth yanked out? How about you do it without anesthetic? Huh? Huh? And by the way, have you ever heard of Dr. Wu Liante? You know, the nerdy Asian guy that, that nobody seems to care about. Yeah, you can thank Dr. Wu Liante for the invention of the, the, the N95 mask. And, and the thing is, the Wu Liante was actually treating victims of the bubonic plague in China, right? He was actually Malaysian, a Malaysian Chinese doctor. He, he actually shares the same surname as me, you know? De, De. <laughs> uh, the Chinese, uh, the actual Chinese version would be Zheng, but the Malaysianized version is De, okay? So my surname is actually Zheng. Um, now this Dr. Wu, the Wu Liante, when he was treating, you know, patients of the bubonic plague in China, um, he noticed that he, 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 he understood that the, the plague was contagious and it was very, very dangerous. And so he devised a mask that would protect people from this plague when entering hospitals and, 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 uh, and, and treatment centers. Now, a French doctor named Mesny, you know, one of those Western chauvinists like Sam Harris, you know, he, he actually refused to put on a mask, just like a lot of Westerners in Asia seem to refuse to put on their masks. He refused to put on a mask because he thought that, well, what would an Oriental, what would an Asian guy know about all this? You know, science is a Western breakthrough, you know? Asians know jack shit about science and technology. I'm gonna go in and treat those people without putting on my mask. And what happened to Mesny? He died of a bubonic plague. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I don't mean to laugh at a poor man's death, but, but you know, if he had not been so arrogant, if he had just listened to the nerdy Asian guy and put on his mask, he would still have been alive. Oh. So you see, it's, it's, it's just some Western academics, I'm sorry, just have a certain sense of uh, the word is, it's a different word from arrogance. It's um, hubris. Yes, yes. They have a certain hubris and sense of smugness when they view Western culture juxtaposed with other cultures. Some, they, they, it's a sense of hubris, I think, that you know, Western culture is this benevolent, enlightened intellectual culture, and Oriental culture is stupid. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and it's a very bold claim of his to say that rule of law originated in the, the Western invention. Yeah, because virtually any civilization in the world, even civilizations like those uh, tribes, well, I don't want to use the word primitive, but so-called primitive tribes in Africa and the Aboriginal Australian Plains, even they have rules of law, even they have sophisticated, um, you know, bureaucracies that, that and they have sophisticated top-down order. Every civilization in this world has got rule of law, and every civilization in this world has got a has got its own 
sophisticated system and institutions. Even, you see, I don't assume that these things were invented by Asians, and I don't assume that these things were invented by Westerners, you see. Okay, another example of Orientalism is the idea that, you know, Orientals are inherently dangerous, beastly, and immoral. Okay, talk to women who have ever dated an Arab man. The reviews are not good. What's wrong with saying they're worse than Western men? They have a sense of entitlement. Civilization begins with civilizing the men. That was Bill Maher who said this actually back in 2014. But you know, as if, you know, basically, he was basically trying to paint uh, Arab men as these dangerous, beastly sexual deviants. And okay, are there Arab men who are dickheads? Yeah, of course, I know a few. But most Arab men that I've met have been extremely kind, courteous to women, and respectful. And guess what? Do you know when Asians think about an entitled man? They're not thinking about Arab men, you know. They're, they're, you know what they're thinking of? Uh, they're thinking of an entitled Western sex pet who comes over to Asia and treats the place like his playground, going around groping the local women. I'm just saying, Bill, I'm just saying, you know, like before you want to take the, 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 the plank out of someone else's eye, maybe, before taking the speck of dust out of someone else's eye, like your the favorite Palestinian philosopher of the West said, take the plank out of your own eye, control your own men first, you know, the, the, your own sex pets who come over to, to Asia to grope the local women, act like assholes and just disrespect the local customs, disrespect, disrespect our culture, disrespect the local men. And, you know, maybe I'll have a modicum of respect for you, okay? <sighs> okay. All right. Another quote by Bill Maher is that painting Orientals as these dangerous, beastly, subhuman are, are, is this. I feel terrible for Palestinian childhood guys. But if it's your father or uncle firing rockets into Israel, then who really is to blame? Okay, this is another Orientalist quote, painting the, Ori the, the West as being um, reasonable and fair-minded and tolerant and painting the Oriental as being aggressive, savage, and barbaric. It basically dehumanizes, you know, the Palestinian fathers, the Palestinian mothers who have lost their children, you know, who have, who, it's an extremely insensitive and extremely disgusting quote that dehumanizes the Palestinians who have lost family members by saying that, well, these people are the ones firing rockets into Israel. These people, you're talking about the gangsters at Hamas, right? Then be specific that we're talking about the gangsters at Hamas. But if you're going to paint Palestinians in the same light, you know, just ordinary Palestinians in Gaza in the same light as the gangsters in Hamas, then you are a disgusting Orientalist. Sorry. Okay, before I end this video, and I'm going to go off, but I, I'm still going to run, squeeze like 20 minutes for running now. Okay. Can Orientalism exist in a, the world of rising Asia? Can the West continue to act in a high-handed, arrogant manner to other cultures? Can it continue to say, your values are shit, our values are gold? Can it continue with this kind of arrogant attitude? Well, you know, I like to quote a very, fit, very prominent uh, Asian academic named uh, Professor Kishore Mabubani from National University of Singapore. Uh, the judgmental the character of the West needs to change in a world that is no longer willing to be judged. In the past, when we could not speak good English, when we were not able to counter the false narrative of Orientalism, then of course we had to accept this misrepresentation and judgment. But now there are people like myself and Professor Mabubani who, was, who actually studied in the West and actually speak good English and have lived in both Asia and the West and can see the myopic manner in which um, some academics on both sides, but mainly in the West, view other cultures. It's, it's kind of like, you know, in the book, To Kill a Mockingbird, um, the, 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 the teacher, you know, she tells the, the, the girl that, you know, in America, we are better than Germany because we have democracy, you know? 
That means everybody has freedom and equality before the law and we don't discriminate, we don't persecute anybody like those Germans persecuting the Jews. And this, ironically, this teacher is the very same person who, who is actually pushing for segregation between blacks and whites, right? This teacher is saying like, oh, those blacks are getting ahead of themselves now. We, we need to put them in their place and, and, and before they start marrying us and getting those, and giving us Tyrone colored grandchildren, you know? So, so this teacher, ironically is saying that we have equality, we have freedom, but as Bernie Sanders has pointed out, uh, you know, in the West, yes, there's freedom and equality, but some people are more equal than others. So uh, just to quote the Palestinian uh, philosopher, your favorite Palestinian philosopher, Judge not lest ye be judged, because if you judge others, others will judge you back. I'm just paraphrasing him. So you always, you Western academics always like to say Western values are better, you know, and, and everybody aspires to be like the West. What if I told you there are people in Asia who do not aspire to be like the West, who actually say things like, oh, if we were like the West, you know, we would have like single mothers from three different fathers, we have degeneracy and immorality in our music. We would have like um, teenage pregnancies on the rise. We would have like, you know, the, uh, uh, we would have things like um, all kinds of perversions, like, you know, uh, what you call it, swingers and all that. There are people in Asia who do not who say things like this and I don't agree with them. In fact, I think, I think that's a, it's an extremely um, bigoted and, rubbish way of looking at the West because Western civilization is not simply this, I, I guess you could say it's Orientalism in reverse. So you don't want to be judged. Don't, then stop judging. Oh, okay. All right. And, and yeah, in order for world peace to exist, I think both East and West need to actually meet at some point, despite the fact that Kipling said that East and West, uh, East is East and West is West and twine shall never meet. I think East, the West has to stop treating us like these um, uh, petulant little children who can't think for ourselves. And, you know, um, I, think, I think the Asians, on the other hand, the people in the East also need to be willing to engage in discourse with reasonable Westerners, you know, who are willing to engage us as well. All right, I'm done. I'm going to go for my run now. I still have like, it's almost 12, but I can still run. Okay. I'm gonna stop recording and end. All right. <laughs>